In the United States, Indigenous women are in the ethnic group most likely to be stalked, raped, and murdered. And almost all of the time, these cases go unsolved and uninvestigated. No arrests, no charges, no justice. Across the United States, there are thousands of unsolved cases involving victims who are Indigenous. Though Indigenous people make up 1.6% of the U.S. population, a staggering 40% of women and girls sex trafficked are Indigenous. Today we tell the story of Kaysera Stops Pretty Places, an 18-year-old high school senior whose life was frozen in time, just like so many Indigenous women and girls in the United States. Welcome to Margs and Mayhem, where I tell you a true crime story and we drink. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, make sure you are of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. 71% of the Crow Nation live on a reservation in South Central Montana. Sloping down from the mountains, great rolling plains are found there. You can see buffalo grazing. It's an area rich with history and the wonders of Mother Earth. This beautiful 3,600 square miles of area also has a grim statistic. It has the highest rate of missing and murdered Native Americans in the entire state of Montana. Tribal leaders in Montana have named I-90, which is the highway that runs through the reservation, as the new trail of tears for the rampant murder and sex trafficking that happens there. The local casino has recently stopped allowing semi-trucks to park in their parking lot overnight for the terrible things that happen in those trucks. The Crow Reservation has just about six tribal police officers to cover the area, which is about three times the size of Rhode Island. Okay, bear with me, this is very confusing. If a non-tribal member commits a crime on the reservation, then the tribal police do not have jurisdiction to arrest them. They can only arrest members of the Crow tribe. Okay. If any person commits a crime on the reservation, tribal or non-tribal, then the city police or the local police who aren't based on the reservation can't arrest them. So there's a swath of people, non-tribal criminals, who commit crimes on the reservation that almost no one can arrest. Now, the people that do have jurisdiction and can do that are the sheriff's office, but, well, more on that BS later. Things are confusing, the agencies don't communicate well with each other, and as a result, there are over 50 cases that are unsolved of missing and murdered indigenous men and women as a result. Kaysera Ruth Stops Pretty Places was born on August 14th, 2001, to her father, Alan Stops, and her mother, Gerilyn Bulltail. She had a mixed indigenous heritage, being both Crow, Northern Cheyenne, and several other tribes. She was baptized into the Catholic Church. In 2012, when she was 11, she moved in with her grandmother, Yolanda Frazier. Ananda Littlebird, who is Kaysera's sister, spoke about Kaysera in a documentary called Missing in Montana. She said that Kaysera was loving and kind and supportive. She was super athletic. She did several sports, including basketball, and she ran track and cross country with her sister. When she was in sixth grade, she went to her grandmother, Yolanda, and said that she wanted to be on the football team. Her grandmother said, Sorry, they don't have football for girls, but instead of giving up, she went straight to the coach, and so the coach put her on the football team. Kaysera had dyslexia, but she worked hard to overcome that challenge in order to get good grades so she could participate in sporting events. She was a fierce and loyal friend. She loved animals. Her grandmother said they must have had a hundred rescued dogs at her house at any one time. She was also a performer. She did speech and theater, and she was in several theater productions at her high school. In fact, that's what she wanted to do after she graduated high school. She wanted to be a performer, an actress. 
Her grandmother had suggested that she maybe go to college first before she headed to New York or Los Angeles to live her dreams. In the summer of 2019, right around the July 4th holiday, Kaysera was kidnapped by a parolee and held against her will for two days. She was strong. She escaped from her captors and made it back home to her family. Instead of seeing this as a reason why she might be more at risk, law enforcement actually, in the end, used this against her. On August 23rd, 2019, Kaysera called her grandmother for the last time. She was out celebrating her birthday with her friends and the start of her senior year of high school. She was actually with a 17-year-old friend and a 19 and 23-year-old couple that were an acquaintance of hers. Something happened, some sort of fight, and the neighbor turned on the lights, tried to get them to stop, and they all started running. She then hopped the fence into a neighboring backyard. By the next morning, Kaysera had not arrived home. Her aunt, Priscilla Brown Boltail, went to the sheriff's office to file a missing persons report. Those of you who follow a lot of true crime may know what happened next. The sheriff told her that she would need to wait 24 hours, a standard waiting period. This is not true, and it's actually specifically against a Montana state law, but that didn't stop him from saying that. The first 24 to 48 hours are crucial in these kinds of cases. They lost out on tons of valuable information and evidence by forcing her aunt to wait the 24 hours. Also, once someone is entered into a missing persons database, that information is shared, communicated, with lots of other agencies. So those agencies that don't communicate well with each other would have all known that there was a missing person. And get this, in the state of Montana, anyone under the age of 21 is a child in the eyes of missing persons. So she would have gotten even higher priority, even more press to hopefully find her and bring her home but she wasn't in any missing persons database. Even after the 24 hour waiting period, they didn't put her in at all. The sheriff naturally dismissed Kaysera's aunt saying, oh, maybe she's out with friends, maybe she's run away and did not take her pleas seriously. On August 29th, six days after Kaysera went missing, a jogger saw a body lying face down with its arms underneath it, behind the wood pile in a backyard at the corner of Mitchell Avenue and Rangeview Drive. That, my friends, was the next door neighbor of the house that Kaysera had last been seen in. Many people in the neighborhood said that body had not been there before that day. They walked by it a lot. It was a very heavy trafficked area. The first officer on the scene was the same officer that Priscilla had begged to take a missing persons report just a week earlier. They didn't cordon the scene off as a crime scene, nor did they even demarcate where the body was found. So people were traipsing through it just like it was the 1800s. A phone was found in the pocket of the body and the jogger actually suggested that police power it up so they could see who this person was. Police denied the request. Word started to travel around the community that a body had been found and Priscilla, Kaysera's aunt, showed up asking to see and identify the body. Her request was denied. The rumor mill continued to grind and so the family went to the mortuary to see if that body was Kaysera's. No, 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 they were told. It was a body, it was a woman, but that woman was in her 30s, so not Kaysera. They left with renewed hope and continued to search for her for days, until September 11th, to be exact, when they were informed officially that the body that had been found two weeks earlier was Kaysera Stops Pretty Places. It's important to note that oftentimes certain people are left out of receiving certain details about cases, because the police are investigating and they want to make sure that they're doing their due diligence and in investigating these kinds of cases. But to just not say anything, to tell them that it was a woman in their 30s, I don't know, it, that seems a little bit wrong to me. A 
especially because the family was literally begging, calling every day, trying to get information, showing up to where things had been found. Her cause of death was officially listed as undetermined. But let's be serious. When does an athletic, healthy, 18-year-old girl who's excited about living her dreams just drop dead in a backyard? Come on, let's be serious. Bullis Mortuary was where Kaysera's body was. Well, sort of. It was being investigated for a while at the ME's office, and then, according to a sheriff, it had actually been snatched at one point by Terry Bullis, and they had to take it back to be investigated further. Weird. All of this is weird. So, in what can be seen as totally, 100%, not a conflict of interest, the owner... Terry Bullis of Bullis Mortuary, was also the county coroner. What the heck? When Kay Sarah's mother went to Bullis Mortuary to get her daughter's body, she was told by Terry that in order to get the body back, it would have to be cremated. Okay, why? Nobody knows. I mean, Kay Sarah's mother was grieving. She, she didn't know what to say. She didn't know what to do. Cremating people is against cultural traditions and practices and beliefs of the Crow people. In fact, if a body is cremated, then that person can't see other members who have passed along to the next stage of their journey. What a horrible thing for him to pressure her into doing. But that's what he did. She didn't know what to do, and so she said yes, and the body was cremated. Let's also not forget that actually at that time, Kaysera's legal guardian wasn't her mother. It was her grandmother, but that didn't matter to Terry Bullis. He just did it. Later, he would say it was like easier or faster or something. What the heck? He was the coroner, so they asked him about cause of death. He said, oh, well, it won't be weeks until the report comes back, but it has something to do with alcohol. What? What a racist piece of garbage. I mean, at the very least, a racist piece of garbage. The Billings Gazette reported nothing about the body, okay, Sarah, for the first month. So the family called them. A reporter for the Gazette apologized and said they hadn't been told anything about a body or a potential crime, that they called the sheriff's office daily to get updates, but no one had said anything about case Sarah. Hmm. Officer Middlestead, who was at the crime scene at the beginning, he actually recused himself from the case. You see, He'd been seen in a recent cell phone video that had gone on to social media brutally beating a teenager at the Crow Fair. That teenager was Kay Sarah's brother. And Kay Sarah had been the one taking the video and posted it to social media. That video had gotten the officers in some trouble. Not a lot of trouble, of course. A little trouble. The family held their first protest of many on October 30th, 2019. After believing their voice was continuing not to be heard and Kay Sarah's case was continuing to be ignored. Elizabeth Carr, who is the senior policy analyst for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, had this to say, quote, the absence of accountability at state and federal law enforcement agencies has forced our families to search for and investigate the crimes when our Native women and girls are murdered or go missing. Native families should never have to do law enforcement's job. The National Indigenous Women's Resource Center stands with Kaysera's family in their demand for justice. End quote. And yet, Kaysera's family continues to do the job that law enforcement is unwilling to do. They don't know who killed her, but they do believe that she was murdered. They do believe that her body was moved after death and was placed behind that wood pile. They continue to call in tips that are continuously ignored by law enforcement. The family has only been granted two meetings, two, with investigators over the last almost three years. To date, no arrests have been made, and as far as the family knows, the investigation is really not continuing. They have requested all documentation, but they said the case is still open, so they wouldn't, they won't give them anything. And yet, the Bighorn County Sheriff's Department has not requested federal help, although they can. They refuse to appear on camera or talk to the media. 
they don't even have any of Kaysera's missing person flyers on file. Hmm. The medical examiner did speak to Kaysera's aunt, I guess off the record, and allegedly said that he thought her death may have been asphyxiation through strangulation by assault, but that didn't appear on any report. The report said undetermined. The answers the family seeks may never be found, in part because of a mortician slash coroner who definitely doesn't have ulterior motives, sure. But here's the thing, crimes don't happen in a vacuum and very rarely do criminals commit a crime and not tell anybody. Kaysera's family is offering a $20,000 reward for any tips that lead to the arrest and conviction of the person who killed Kaysera or people. You can submit tips through the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office, the number I'll put in the description box, or you can actually phone in or email the tips to Kaysera's family's lawyer, which given the history of the Sheriff's Department seems like probably a better idea to be honest. So what's going on in Bighorn County? Kaysera's story is one of many, 28 girls and women to be exact. Is there a serial predator? Does someone sort of understand the law and how complicated things are and is using that to their advantage? and has been getting away with it for years? Is there some kind of sex trafficking operation that isn't even being investigated because of the long-standing racist history of law enforcement in the area? Or in case Sarah's case is a little more complicated than even that. Remember that video that she posted? What's going on there? And what's the deal with a coroner that insists on a body being cremated? The family didn't even want to use his funeral home, I'd like to add, but were also pressured to do that. Who does that? It's really, really weird. Suspicious. A follow-up report was released by Bighorn County Attorney Jay Harris in August of 2021 related to the death of Kaysera. I'd like to point out, they didn't even report her name correctly. They reported it as Kaysera stops at pretty places which isn't her name. So wondering how great of a report that's going to be. Hmm. The report does state interestingly that for approximately three weeks, the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office did absolutely nothing in the investigation of the death of Kaysera Stops Pretty Places. There is a very active website and Facebook group for justice for Kaysera, both of which I'll link in the description box below. There is a petition for justice for Kaysera and for law enforcement to actually investigate what's going on. It's nearing 300,000 signatures, so why don't you take two minutes and help them get over that threshold. And for the last few years, Kaysera's family has led sort of a, a week of justice initiatives for Kaysera, but that happens in August and September. However, we can still do that advocacy right now. We don't have to wait. Kaysera Ruth Stops Pretty Places graduated posthumously from Hellgate High School in 2020. But she should have graduated for real. She should have been able to go to college and live her dreams to be a performer. She should be able to start a family and live a life. Kaysera Stops Pretty Places should have been allowed to grow old. We all have a role to play when it comes to helping Kaysera's family seek justice and in shedding a light on what's happening to indigenous women and girls in the United States. Kaysera's family attorney had this to say, quote, shame on local and federal law enforcement for doing nothing. Evidence has been ignored. Suspects have been allowed to walk free, unquestioned. Search warrants have not been executed. This is inexcusable. It's time to let the Montana Department of Justice FBI, and the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office know that we hold them accountable, end quote. It starts here. I have eight letters addressed to groups like the FBI and the Montana State Attorney in order to demand justice for Kaysera. The family has made it super easy for you. They have sample language, addresses, everything you need right on their website, justiceforkaysera.org. It honestly took me less than 15 minutes to compile and that included printing and stuffing. Very, very easy. Okay, here's the thing. If you commit to doing this and you submit to me a picture of the letters or you with the letters or you mailing the letters, I will donate 
$10 to the Justice Fund in order to increase that reward and hopefully find someone who knows something. Really easy. 15 minutes and the cost of some stamps and I'll donate the money. So you don't really have too much of an excuse. Let's do it together. Thanks for hanging out with me. I've put some really important resources in the description box and I sincerely hope that you'll check them out. I know this episode is a little bit different from what I normally do, but it can't always be about the mayhem and the margaritas here on our channel. It's really important to me that we shed light on the things that we can when we know about them and do our really small part to help end injustice. I'm wondering what you're challenging yourself to do when you hear about injustice. Make sure you're following me on social media. And if you haven't followed me on YouTube yet, I, I would really appreciate if you, if you would do that. If nothing, then for this episode alone, let's help spread the reach where we can. Grab some molasses and the other ingredients for a classic margarita for next week's episode. I'll see you next week. Please remember to write your letters and submit your photographs. Let's shed some light together.